Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. And uh, it's so good to see you guys here today, and it's so good to see you all at home. Remember that we shoot this show live at the Vancouver Film School Cafe at uh, 390 West Hastings, and we would love to see your happy, smiling faces. Uh, it's a bit miserable in Vancouver, so this is a, a nice uh, place to come. It's nice and warm in here. It's also licensed. They sell food and coffee, and uh, you can have a good time. Uh, you can get a, a, a free show out of that. Uh, listen, I've got a, a couple of uh, dedications to give out. Uh, one of them, this rundown is dedicated to our friend Adam McKenzie, who says, uh, misses a good TV show like Electric Playground. You know what? You don't have to miss it. You can watch it right here. And we have all kinds of fantastic guests, like our guest today, Emilio Lopez, who is the artist uh, working on all of the cut sequences on the brand new Contra Rogue Corps. We're going to get into an, a great interview with him after the run down. Uh, we're also going to dedicate to uh, Sid Haig, who has been in lots of Tarantino movies and uh, lots of horror movies. He recently passed away, so our condolences to his uh, friends and family, and also to uh, Aaron Eisenberg from uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, who was only 50 years old, uh, and uh, I believe his character was Nog, is that right? Yeah, uh, our condolences to all of the fans of Star Trek and all of his family and friends as well. Uh, that's way too young to pass away. Um, but also, I want to give a, a special shout out to uh, my buddy Paul Adamson, uh, who reached out and said he wanted to give me a gift. And uh, this is what he gave me. It is a uh, Batman NES cartridge where it looks like Batman is busting out of the cartridge. It's made by a toy maker. Oh, you, it's actually, yeah, it's got a profile on it, so it actually reaches out. So this is like a piece of art. It's made by toy maker Steve Casino, uh, and if you go to his Twitter uh, handle, which is just spelt like it is, Steve Casino with a one, uh, you can watch him make this for me, which is so freaking cool. Thank you so much. This is awesome. So uh, this will go, uh, I don't think we're going to keep it in the set, but it'll go in my display stuff with some of my other bat gear. Anyways, that's enough ramble. Let's get going with your rundown, and it's dedicated to Adam McKenzie. We didn't get a full game reveal on Batman Day, speaking of Batman, but it looks like something big is on the way. Batman Arkham Origins developer Warner Brothers Games Montreal has dropped what appears to be new hints about their long-rumored new Bat game. Co coinciding with the 80th anniversary of the character, they've begun posting cryptic logos on their various social media channels, many of which appear to be based around the villainous Court of Owls. There were already rumors that the Court of Owls would be featured in the next Batman game, so this could be their way of confirming it, but We'll have to wait for more official announcements. There's no telling how long that might take. I am one of those guys that loved what that team did on Batman Arkham Origins. Yes, it might not be up to the, the standards of the Rocksteady stuff, but they did some really, really cool stuff with Origins. I like the detective mode. I like the storytelling. They had a fantastic uh, Deathstroke sequence in there. They cast different actors in the roles, but they did a great job. That was Troy Baker and Roger Craig Smith. Uh, and they did an amazing, uh, it was an amazing, uh, you know, creative collaboration to build that game. I had a blast with that and uh, they could only have gotten stronger as game makers and uh, learned a lot from what Rocksteady did with Bar Batman Arkham Knight so yeah it's time uh, not only for Rocksteady to reveal what they're they've got up their sleeves but also for uh, Warner Brothers to share the Batman development love with other teams like the uh, the Montreal team very very interested to see what they've got up their sleeves I suspect that it's uh, because there's been um, logos that kind of tease the Court of Owls but also the um, uh, the the Rasha Ghoul, uh, what is it? Okay, so League of League of Assassins, Demon's Head. I think we're probably going to see a little uh, Ra's al Ghul and uh, Court, uh, Court of Owls kind of stuff in a new Batman game. Maybe maybe uh, Batman's in the middle of all of that, which would be. I would love that so much. Uh, but uh, we'll know soon. And trust me, as soon as we do know, we're going to be talking with um, Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers Games Montreal about what they've got cooking. Uh, and speaking of Batman news, it looks like uh, Jonah Hill is uh, going to be one of the villains in uh, Matt Reeves' new Batman film. We don't know who it's going to be. Could could be the Riddler, could be the Penguin. Um, I, I, I'm sure they want to keep a lot of that stuff secret for a little while. They'll have some huge marketing campaign around this. Jonah Hill's an awesome actor. Uh, very excited about that, and it looks like uh, our new Commissioner Gordon might be Jeffrey Wright, who I love. 
Uh, he's a fantastic actor. He's done some incredible work. I like him as uh, Felix Leiter in the uh, Bond movies. He's been great on Westworld. Uh, that is some really, really good casting right there. And it excites me. This movie is coming together. Uh, and we're, we're going to start to see some stuff on it. And I'm, I'm super excited. I'm even getting over the whole Robert Pattinson kind of drama that I had before. So uh, I, I'm just getting hyped for this new Batman flick. Now, we might not have to wait much longer uh, to start playing The Last of Us Part 2. The release date for the new game has apparently been leaked. Several retailers have listed the game as coming out on February 28, 2020, complete with a standard version and a fancy special edition with extra content, although no official announcements have been made yet. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, Sony will be streaming a new State of Play presentation tomorrow, so don't be surprised if the release date is made official during the broadcast. The first game uh, uh, was uh, one of the last big exclusives for the PlayStation 3 when it launched back in 2013 and part two will be one of the final big exclusives for the playstation 4 and like the first last of us game i expect that it will be something that we will uh, be able to play in an enhanced version on the playstation 5 um, and presumably that's been part of the uh, the long wait that we've had for the last of us part two um, uh, neil Druckmann has been posting all kinds of little teases speaking of posting teases all kinds of teases about uh, revealing more about this game very soon. Uh, so check back with us on uh, on Wednesday's show. We should have lots to talk about with The Last of Us Part 2. Now it looks like Borderlands 3 is already earning its developers a huge pile of loot. Gearbox and publisher 2K Games have announced that Borderlands 3 has become the fastest selling game ever released by 2K, shipping 5 million units to stores. They haven't said how many copies have, have actually been sold, but have said that the new game has more than doubled the launch window sales of its predecessors, Borderlands 2, which, uh, predecessor Borderlands 2, which went on to sell more than 22 million units. And what signals a growing trend in the industry 2K also says that le no less than 70% of Borderlands 3's sales have been on digital rather than physical media, likely due to the PC version being an Epic Game Store exclusive. Um, I'm going to have the re my review of Borderlands 3 in this episode, so stay tuned for that. I'm not surprised uh, by the reception to this game. It's been seven years, I think, since the, since the previous Borderlands title. Uh, it, not you know counting all the re-releases and all the stuff that, uh, that Gearbox has been doing. Um, and and uh, one of the questions that Blake posed in the script here is, would it have been a bigger hit if it was on more platforms, presumably uh, also on Steam and maybe even a, a, a Nintendo Switch version of the game? Uh, or a VR version of the game, which they did uh, Borderlands 2 in VR. Uh, yeah, and I think all of those are coming. You know, I think we're going to start to see this game get ported. I think we're also going to get a, a lot more content than what was available at launch, uh, clearly with DLC and, and enhancements and tweaks. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that it's a big game. It's There are fewer huge AAA experiences like this made in a year than flashing back, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and so when these games come out and they have all of this big marketing push and all of the anticipation and all of us have our consoles that have the horsepower or the PC systems that have the horsepower to show off content like this, we want it, you know? And so uh, there, there's an appetite for it. It's a proven brand. It's well-made. And uh, yeah, it deserves this attention. And, um, and I'll get into my thoughts on the game a little bit later. So stay tuned for that. Uh, now, while we're... Uh, Oh, Apple has just launched their Apple Arcade mobile gaming platform, and now Google wants in on the action. Google has launched their own subscription-based mobile gaming platform for Android devices. It's called Google Play Pass, and for 5 bucks a month, users will get unlimited access to a library of 350 games, and the service also includes regular non-game apps. Like their upcoming Stadia platform, Google plans to... Uh, uh, grow Play Pass with more games in the future. For now, it's only available in the U.S. This is like an arms race for how many <laughs> games you get for your five bucks a month right now, uh, that, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's um, it's certainly ushering in a whole new way to monetize on these games, and it's gonna. There's probably going to be a lot of blood in the streets as developers kind of shift and and figure out how they can uh, keep their businesses afloat. And certainly, uh, you know, probably companies like Google and Apple are throwing millions of dollars at, at games to lock up exclusivity and to make sure that these platforms get a lot of attention and succeed. I've been playing Apple Arcade titles all weekend, and I've been very impressed. There's a lot of really, really cool indie titles on there. And contrary to what uh, Johnny Millennium and I talked about during the, uh, the arcade conversation, 
the literal arcade conversation that we had on Friday's show. Uh, we should watch that video if you haven't. He was very opposed to the idea of mobile gaming because of the lack of physical buttons. I've hooked up controllers to the Apple Arcade games, and almost every one that I played um, has ha had functionality. I've been playing uh, Skate City and uh, has had controller functionality. Skate City and uh, Sayonara Wild Hearts, Sonic Racing, uh, the new Frogger game, which is made by Q Games, which is actually really, really charming. Um, there's, there's a lot of good titles. I'll be talking more specifically about those games uh, over the coming days, but uh, yeah, this, uh, th this new move away from microtransactions and loot boxes and all these crazy in-game economies with a free-to-play kind of uh, quote on the, on the titles to a subscription-based, you get everything you want and you can play them offline type of model, which is what's happening with uh, Apple Arcade and Google, Google Pay, uh, Play Pass is very exciting and gives us a lot to talk about. Now, we're still waiting to find out about the next-gen consoles, but it looks like they're going to be green. Sony and Microsoft have both revealed that their upcoming consoles will be uh, more environmentally friendly. Microsoft says the next Xbox, codenamed Project Scarlet, will be carbon neutral, meaning that the amount of carbon released during the making of the device will be removed by Microsoft somewhere else in the world and that will create a net zero footprint. Sony, on the other hand, says that the PlayStation 5 will be much more energy efficient than its predecessors, particularly when gameplay is paused or suspended. Both the next-gen Xbox and PlayStation 5 are expected to hit stores next year. This is great news. Uh, it's something that I, I would love to see um, more of the video game industry kind of not only adopt, but uh, uh, tell the world about. And quite frankly, climate change is such a, uh, you know, a, a crisis for all of us around the world that it would be great to see games tackle this, you know, maybe shift away from the zombie apocalypse and, and uh, to focus a little on the literal apocalypse. Like, how are we going to deal with uh, cities that are underwater and, and, uh, and, you know, the lack of food and all of these pressures that we're all ha waking up from nightmares uh, with every night. Um, but in addition to content being focused on not only, uh, you know, the horrors of what may befall us, maybe we can also talk about some of the solutions and some of that game content. It'd be great to see things like this with consoles. Um, and Nintendo's actually got a really cool building, which we should talk about it's in some uh, future episode of EP, where they're incredibly uh, energy efficient, and they've got a lot of green space. They've got green, um, they've got... Um, uh, greenery growing on their roof, and uh, it's a very, very um, well-categorized, efficient building. And they obviously have been making lots of money recently with the Switch, so they invested a lot into their space. It's a very impressive uh, HQ when you go and visit it, and it'd be uh, very cool to hear that more of that is happening with game developers and game publishers. But of course, they need to sell you the games first. They need to be making the money so they can make huge retro uh, uh, sort of adjustments to their buildings like that. All right, you guys, that's our rundown for today. Thank you very much for watching that. Now it's time to take a look back at this day and everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for September 23rd. On this day in 1889, the most famous video game company in the world was founded almost a century before the invention of video games. Japanese businessman Fuzajiro Yamauchi founded a small company called Nintendo Kopai in Kyoto with the aim of making Hanafuda, or Japanese playing cards. The cards were handmade at first, but as they got more and more popular, Yamauchi began to mass produce them, and Nintendo eventually became one of the biggest card companies in the country. In the mid-20th century, after World War II, Nintendo expanded into other ventures like toys, and in the 1970s, they began to release their first electronic toys. Their first was an arcade game called EVR Race, released in 1975, which was created by young programmers Genyo Takeda and Shigeru Miyamoto, who Nintendo had recently hired. In 1979, another Nintendo designer, Gunpei Yokoi, created the Game & Watch handheld devices, which relied on primitive LCD cutouts behind the screen to bring simple games to life. Nintendo also continued creating new arcade games, with their biggest hit, Donkey Kong, smash arcades in 1982. After seeing the success that other game companies like Atari were having with home consoles, Nintendo decided to create their own. The Famicom, short for Family Computer, was released in Japan in 1983 and was renamed the NES, or Nintendo Entertainment System, when it hit North America two years later. You know the rest of the story. 
All right, we are back, and we have a fantastic guest today. His name is Emilio Lopez, and if you've been following uh, some of the comic books associated with video games or some of the comic art or some of the, uh, you know, cool um, uh, characterizations of some of your favorite characters online, chances are pretty good that you've seen some of Emilio Lopez's work. Uh, but tomorrow... He has got artwork that is going to be a part of the brand new Contra game that Konami is publishing, and he's here to tell us all about it. Please welcome Emilio Lopez. Good to see you, my friend. Hello, guys. This is uh, your home studio in New York that you're joining us from? Actually, this is uh, Philadelphia. I moved here about three years ago. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Philadelphia is an awesome city. How did you get connected with the video game industry, Emilio? What do you, I know that this is, uh, yeah, I've met you many times at E3s over the years. Yeah. But how it's, did you make that first connection? It's, a, it's actually kind of a crazy sort of thing. Because uh, so uh, I, obviously I've, I've worked as a freelance artist for years. I've worked in comic books. I've worked in animation on like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Black Dynamite, Metalocalypse, and Adventure Bros. And I've worked in comics like... Marvel, um, you know, Spider-Man and all kinds of other stuff and DC and all that. And the video game stuff, it's it's I've always been into video games. So it's always been in there. So like like in 2013, when you actually met me yeah. the, for the first time, it was outside of out of a out of an EA um, event at E3. Yep. That show, I was actually uh, I was actually covering the show as a photographer for uh for the for a site run by a friend of mine, Torrance Davis. So along with all the freelance stuff, I'm doing this as well, and that's kind of where my where kind of I kind of got involved in all this stuff. So, I you know I always wanted to work in video games and stuff like that. And like one thing I made a decision about years ago is like, especially to, to survive as a freelance artist, you kind of have to be a bit more wider and be able to do more things than just one thing. So right, that's right. how it kind of, kind of sort of came across. And the other thing was that I, I just, at that, or, and that at time I also started posting my, my the, the stuff that I would do in my spare time. A lot of times, uh, a lot of it is actually Metal Gear stuff, and I actually am known on the internet a little bit more for my Metal Gear stuff than the the, the wider array of things that I've worked on, which well, is kind of funny. Which is great, though. I mean, it kind of speaks to the openness and and um, you know the accessibility of the video game uh, creators out there. I mean, you you went yeah. to e E3 with a portfolio. That's one thing I definitely do remember about you. Yeah. I think you had been a fan of G4 and you were watching G4 and you oh, came yeah. up. And, oh and yeah. It was like, I, I, it was like, because the E3, like at least back then it was just like, you, you'd see everybody, you'd see all the guys that you, you know, see, like I met, you know, uh, Greg Miller and all that stuff. And when I came with that stuff, and the, the and the print that I gave you, I was yeah. actually I, I had just done like a, a comic convention somewhere in Chicago. I think it was C2E2, and I had a bunch of additional stuff already. And I was like, you know what? Maybe while I'm covering this thing, I'll just if I see anybody who who I know likes like art and Metal Gear stuff, I said, you know, I'll just give it to you. So like that's what I did. So I I, I gave one to you outside of the EDA thing. I saw Greg Miller. I gave one to him, and I gave one uh, to uh, a guy on uh, the PlayStation Axis, um, uh, uh, Robert Robert Pier uh, Pearson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unreal. So. And I I know that you've worked with Kojima over the years as well, right? Well, not not really. I've actually not worked with him at all. Uh, I, there was maybe one thing that was mentioned to me uh, a while ago, but it really wasn't. It, nothing really came of it. Okay. Uh, I think he. I think he, one of his guys mentioned. They said they want to work with me at some point, but it really never happened. Uh, but so it's all been out of a love for Metal Gear. Like all of that work that we've seen of yours has yes, just been for because it, you love just, it. Yeah, it's just stuff that I would do in my spare time in between doing freelance jobs or big things like that. And that's all that stuff that, that I was posting online. Yeah, that's all. Crazy. That. <laughs> is that what led? Because obviously, you know, Konami is very sort of connected to their fans mm -hmm. out there. Is that how you built a bit of a relationship with Konami? They knew that you were uh, big. On yeah, Metal Gear? that it was that was it was that it was. Ken, you know, Kenichu Kenichi Imaizumi reposting my stuff. That's Kojima's um, producer. producer. Yeah. Um, the, it was Kojima himself reposting my artwork and then Konami posting my artwork as well. So it was wow. all of these sorts of things. So it's like, uh, you know, it, it's not like like my stuff. It, like I can I can kind of do a lot of different styles and stuff like that. So it seemed like it, it really impressed them. And that's where I kind of got 
into the Konami thing. And that's where I started talking with them about something. It didn't We didn't know what it was. It was just like, hey, we want to do something in the future. And that's kind of how it began. That is um, wonderful. And then, of course, it, it, things got very different for Metal Gear and for <laughs> Kojima mm-hmm. Productions and stuff. Are you, uh, is, because you're such a Kojima fan, are you excited for Death Stranding? And have you done a bunch of Death Stranding stuff? Oh uh, yeah, it's it, it it was actually kind of hard for me to do a little of that stuff because you know you don't know really much about it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did a couple of I did, I did a series of little shibi like uh, Death Stranding things, and these are again between all the bunches of projects I've been working on, I'm doing this stuff as well. So that's that's kind of awesome. Uh, one of the things that I uh, really have loved that you did you did covers I think for the Batman Arkham Knight uh, comic collection. Yes, uh, that was with uh, Gene, uh, Gene, uh, Fabok, who, who is a current DC artist. I actually worked with him on uh, Batman uh, Detective Comics, so maybe uh, 23 and 24 a while ago. Nice. And uh, they actually asked us to like do. They're like, "Hey, you know, you want to do this?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's go for it." So yeah, that was a special edition cover that we did for if you pre if you if you got the game, you got a comic book with it, and it came with this cover that we did. Uh, it's yeah, so that's it right incredible. there. <laughs> and that must feel amazing as a fan of the medium to kind of, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, you had success already as a freelance artist and working yeah. in animation and all that, but you're, you're just a fan of these games and what this creativity allows you. And then suddenly you're contributing to that world. That must yeah. feel incredible. Yeah, it's 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 crazy because it's like uh, I mean I couldn't I could have never imagined like when Metal Gear Five came out I actually did an art show for that for Konami yep. and then then a few years then later after that I did bi- some stuff with Bioshock and then I did you know some stuff with uh you know the the Zone of Ender Second Runner and this is kind of all born from the 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 just the stuff that I did in my spare time which is that's, kind of funny that's wild <laughs> and, and so what I also think. I also think that the other thing that helped it is because I was I have already been kind of a time tested of uh, uh, you know uh, freelancer for about for years since I had done it. Yeah, I mean, and you're working with great studios and they're putting a lot of faith and trust into you. But I I love this story of because uh, it's the EP story as well, right? Like, <laughs> and I think it's every fan website that ends up becoming a uh, a professional one and. It, it, the games industry is pretty incredible for that. And it's not like the comics industry is closed off, but you've worked in comics. Was it a bit of a tougher break in when you started to do art for comics or was, did you find that as receptive? Well, no, it's it, it actually, it actually wasn't. It was, uh, it's funny because uh, I, when I, my, my original dream job yeah. was to become a comic book artist. But, uh, at the time that I became involved and got, got into the industry, I was, uh, I became an intern at a really, really kind of dark time in comics when Marvel comics was actually going, oh, yes. uh, bankrupt. When and, you could buy uh, all of Marvel for a hundred million bucks. <laughs> yes. So at that imagine? point in time, I'm an intern there and I'm seeing people crying at their desks and I'm seeing, wow. I'm seeing all these people getting let go. And it, it just kind of affected me at the time. I'm like, maybe, maybe this is something I don't, maybe I can't get into this sort of thing. Right. So at that point in time, I made the decision. I'm like, you know what? Uh, maybe if this comic thing doesn't work out, I, I, I need an, I need, I don't, uh, I I need to have there. There doesn't need to be any excuse why a, a company or somebody would hire me to do something in artwork. It doesn't really matter what it is. So That's at cool. that point, I was like, "All right." I uh, decided to go. Uh, I uh, w- w- took like got an illustration degree, and then I uh, took an internship at uh, on on animation, and that's how where I started in animation. That's great. Like you know, doing stuff in animation, and then the animation stuff kind of led to comics because I ended up working with a guy who I've been working with for close to ten years now, Kari Randolph, who I'm doing my new book, Excellence, with for uh, Skybound Entertainment. Nice. I, he was like, we got let go all at the same time. We're all working at uh, at this company, and he's like, hey, I'm thinking of getting back into comics again. So uh, you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So I became his colorist for for about ten years. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so you, you, you got a uh, an illustration degree. You actually went mm-hmm. to school to kind of learn some of the fundamentals. Do, oh do yeah. You, do you still draw your work with pencil and paper, or are you all digital now? Uh yeah, I'm all digital now. But it was it's about it really for me. It doesn't really matter what I'm using. It's just like it's just about transferring that knowledge to the other you know to other platforms and stuff like that. So it wasn't. 
like before that I had already been a painter and I had already inked my hand and all that stuff. So it's just about finding ways of getting that to work in, in like the digital space. That's wonderful. Amelia, you've had a lot of cool projects and a lot of success in yeah. this world. And I know that a lot of people that are watching are going to wonder how, how they do it. And I think one of the cool things about you is your ability to network and connect with people on it. So give us an insight into that. What, what do you, what are some of the, 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 you know, tricks of the trade for you in order to get people to remember you and to keep hiring you? Well, I mean, I, I'm the, the main thing is I actually just try to do the, do, be a, a good worker and do the best that you can with the job. I mean, uh, I've, I've made these sorts of connections within the industry because I've been a reliable, you know, I've been reliable for years yep. and also just been able to, to kind of, throw away any sort of a lot of the ego that comes with a lot of that stuff and just be able to kind of, all right, you know what? It's not exactly what I'm wanting to do, but you know, let's make this thing the best thing that we can at this point in time. And that's, that's kind of how I've, I've, I've sort of looked at it. I mean, yes, you want to be, obviously you want to be the top guy. You want to be the guy like, yeah, that's the first guy that you think of, but it does. It doesn't exactly work like that. So yeah. you have to be able to work in teams and work with pe other people. And through that, you earn reputations with people, and then that they go on to other things. All the 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 Bioshock thing, the the uh, and the, what was it? The uh, Zone of Enders things were all inter kind of born from all the things that I did before, which is yeah. interesting. So yeah, yeah. You 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 provide a solution. Yeah, not just, exactly. Not just the talent. You provide the solution, and you exactly you you uh, are a fair person to work with, and people remember that. Exactly. You don't. Yeah. You know, like obviously, when you obviously when somebody asks you, say, "Hey, you know, uh, we, what do you think about?" So you give your you give your opinion, and you like, and you, but you're really playing jazz. You're riffing off of what they're working with. Cool. So it's I like, like if you can't, I feel like if you can't exactly play along, that that's when things start to become problems. You know. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you were working in comics when it was a bit of a darker time. How how are comics now as an artist? Is there a lot of work? Or, or it's is a, morale it's, high? It's a comics now for me. It's been has been very good because I just I just kind of like I like working with Kari Randolph and I like doing stuff like so like all the different connections I've made to that. I f I find it's, it works out really well. I do like that the the fact. That, you know, the digital space has kind of opened up things to people that wouldn't normally be able to get these sorts of books. There's a lot more books out now than there had ever been. Right. And they're a lot easier to get your hands on. Yes. As opposed to, you know, you're, you're, you know it's unfortunately because I'm, I'm a, you know, paper comic book guy. And, you know, it's sad to see some of these stores sort of kind of go to the wayside. But I, there is that space now where you can get those sorts of books that you would never usually see on the shelf. I'm a paper guy too, uh, you know, yeah. I have a pretty good collection of it all, but I have to admit like the act of being able to zoom in on art you know, on, a, on an <laughs> iPad, it's, it's kind of, it spoils you a little bit, you know, have you, have you, you done the thing where you've walked up to a comic and uh, on paper and tried to zoom in on it? Uh, actually, no, I have actually I've never done that. Uh, like I, I have, a, I have very little, little digital comics. I actually have more actual physical comics. Oh, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have to admit like that Marvel, um, ultimate collection where you pay your hundred bucks a year and mm -hmm. you get 25,000. That's a pretty compelling deal for me. I like yeah, that a, very much. A, a good buddy of mine really loves that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about, uh, Contra Rogue Corps, which, uh, is launching tonight. And tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. So, do you have butterflies right now? Are you nervous? Are you excited? <laughs> How do you feel? This is part. This is your baby. Oh wow. Am I nervous? I, you know what's funny? Like again, I like a, you kind of do a lot of these things, and uh, it's just so like it. Like I don't. I, I don't have any butterflies with it. I just feel like I'm like this. It's finally. It's finally it's that that sigh of relief that it's finally kind of out there. Yeah. I kind of felt that a little bit when I finished when I finished off the the, uh, the the at least the initial first motion comic that we did for, yep. for it. You know yep. the full the full the in game one. But I feel like it really sort of hit me when I actually was started going to events like uh, the one that we had over the weekend and as well as the the um, the one that we did, you know, when we were at E3 and just seeing it all over the walls and I'm like, wow, this that was that your stuff, art, wasn't that it? That was my work. And, yeah. and I was like, 
that stuff doesn't actually get old. I've, <laughs> again, like me being on Ninja Turtles and me being on all this stuff, seeing my stuff on TV, that I'm like, wow. It's like, because, you know, you, you work at this stuff for so long, so many hours. And then just to have that sigh of relief and then all of a sudden, boom, it's on TV magically. Yeah. You know, yeah. or on a on a store shelf. I, that that is the part that I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And then just yeah, and then somebody handing me over a, 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 a the, the game. I mean, <laughs> the actual game with my work on it. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's fantastic. Um, tell people that don't know because uh, I've just started to get into this game. I'm I'm going to try to have uh, some thoughts on the game tomorrow. <laughs> but tell people that don't know what is the concept for Contra Rogue Core and uh, what did you contribute to it. Well, the concept of a rogue core is, well, then, well according to Nakazato-san, it's really just about having fun. You're not really supposed to take the game really that serious. It's over the top. I mean, I mean, Contra in general has always been about over the top stuff. Like, I mean, think about Contra 3, right? A guy, you know, jo- goes from a, a hover motorcycle and jumps onto a missile that's that's being shot at a monster, <laughs> you, you know, and you're, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And I think that's the sort of thing he's sort of trying to go. Of course, sort of simple sort of gameplay, easy to pick and play, and you can play anywhere that you want. You can play with your friends, you know, in, on couch co-op. You can play online. And I think that's the sort of thing that he's trying to go for. For me, on the on the on the motion comic end, it was just it, where it was about sort of developing um, uh, Nakazato-san's uh, uh, st- plot because he had a he had a he, for him he had a, it seemed like he had a, a plot that he had us kind of work off and then we sort of develop it on our on the motion comic side. So it's a, we had writers and we have uh, you know all kinds of stuff to kind of help flesh out those ideas. And what was just great about it is that he kind of let us. Uh, play with these ideas, you know, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, obviously he had, he had specific ideas for certain things, but he was uh, able to kind of look like, okay, yeah, that actually, yeah, you know, if you, you do this, also do this, you know, which was really great, uh, you know, even though it, you know, there's also that sort of language barrier and everything. There's a, there's a process, especially when dealing with, uh, with folks from Japan, you just a whole, you have to get things translated and you have to go through all, all those different things. But I do feel like it was, it worked out really well with us. That's awesome. Were you guys sent um, uh, concept art on the characters, or did you? And then were you guys able to kind of, you know, tailor the characters in different ways, and then that was reincorporated back into the 3D polygon models, or how did that work? Oh well, the the initially when I got on the project, on, on a, um, it was everything was more when we were first talking about it was that everything was already designed. Uh, so Kaiser and uh, Hungry Beast and all the characters from the game were already designed by uh, Nakazato seems in Japan. Yep. And for us on the motion comic team, it's really more about adapting those sorts of things to the motion comic. Obviously, because you have all these, you know, these are, these are 3d models and, uh, you know, a lot, you know, you just, all you need to do is just draw it once, you know, you just make it once and then it does it all. It draws every single angle that you need it cool. for us. You know, I, I, and the, and uh, on our other guy and the other guys were working on it, had to essentially, you know, draw, draw everything. So, you know, just finding those places where we can fit it in and all that stuff. That's awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. what's the story of the game? Can you take us into what's, what's actually going on? Well, uh, you know, after the after the alien wars, wars this, uh, you know, everybody thought that the that the aliens were gone, but uh, something else happens, and that's what we see in the in our, our our first cinematic, which is the damn city just pops out of the ground with all these different fiends and everything. Uh, you're also kind of show, I notice you're showing uh, our uh, our recent motion comic, which yep. uh, kind of uh, f- uh, fills in the gap between. Uh, the the last Contra games and our new uh, Rogue Core game. So and that that and the game also kind of explained that to what, what where where we're going and where, where we're going to uh, you know come to. That's cool. Um, you've got a lot of the core Contra team that worked on games like Contra Three worked on yes. this game. Is is it the same team inside of Konami, or was it an outside uh, development? I'm not exactly sure of the inter who uh, the, the, as far as the internal team, uh, but I do know Nakazato-san is he's he's Contra from like Contra Three, Contra he's, Hardcore. He's Mr. Contra. He, yeah, he's Mr. Contra. He <laughs> knows these titles, and he's worked on the Ninja Turtles arcade game. In fact, our game has a little a little uh, Easter egg of that. When you hit one of the when you uh, when one of the monsters gets their energy kind of low, he kind of 
shoulder check them and they go flying into the screen like the old Ninja Turtle games. I, I noticed kind of that, yeah. yeah. And I've, I've been uh, reviewing a lot of these 16-bit superhero games recently, and yeah. I noticed, I was like, yeah, I know what that's that what they're doing yeah. right there. When I play the game, so f I mean, I'm not super deep into it, but it kind of mm -hmm. feels like it's um, it feels like a Smash TV variant of a Contra type of experience. Yeah, it's a definitely it definitely feels it feels like Smash TV or Dead Nation or um, you know those sorts of sorts of waves and you know twin stick sort of shooter sort of games. Uh, yeah. But I do but I do but every so often the game sorts of kind of changes views. Kind of like the, a little bit like the way the original Contras used to do where like you've played the arcade game like one minute you're side scrolling then many you're top angle then you're behind the Ryu and I, and the game kind of does that too especially when you fight bosses you see we go behind uh, over the shoulder view and you can fight like a uh, big fuzz or any of the other guys that are in there. That's awesome. When they were putting the uh, motion comics together, were they sending you proofs and, and uh, were you having to kind of retool any of the art to match, you know, some of the, the hysterics out of the voice room or anything like that? Uh, no, well, like what we, the way we did, the way we did this is, uh, I mean, motion comics are, you know, well, so a lot, just like a misconception about motion comics where it's, it's actually just a comic that you just animate and do the stuff too, but all of it has, it's essentially a limited animation project. Mm -hmm. So we did it essentially like we would do an animation project. We do was we go in first and we, um, you know, have our, you know, we first do storyboards, then we do an animatic, you know, then our, you know, once the animatic is, is approved, then we start, um, we start doing, um, you know, uh, actual cleaned up artwork and, uh, you know, then we, you know, we have, we have the sound and all that stuff. One great thing about doing sound, um, for a motion comic is that there's no lip movements to it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, at least yeah. for this one, we don't need to do that. And, uh, that's our, that's our, our guys, um, Ryan Kelly and, and, uh, uh Jason Navias, our art director and animators, they did it all that, the, all that motion that you see in there. That's all those guys. Wow, that's great. So, were you guys all working together in the same facility and putting it all together like that? It, what, the way it started was it was a more of a freelance project, but then uh, everybody sort of felt that it would be better that to bring me in. So, essentially, for uh, maybe six months or so, I was commuting up to New York City from my my place out in here in Pennsylvania, yeah. and uh, it was it was actually really great uh, to be back there because I had worked there ten years ago. Yeah. Which is hilarious because the, the the company remember the company that when I when I said like oh yeah we got we let go and I moved into comics and all that stuff that yeah. was the same company I did Ninja Turtles at oh, wow. Konami Konami eventually acquired that company oh my god <laughs> yeah so ten years later so uh, like this was it's like in that night two thousand nine we all get let go because of you know a lot of things happening and you know all this stuff the company was going bankrupt eventually Konami picks up the company. And yeah, 10 years later, I come back and it's and it's our same guys like our um, Jason and uh, Ryan. They used to work on Ninja Turtles. We had our, our, our character designer, Adrian Barrios from Ninja Turtles doing ad additional incidental characters like Lily. We had our background designer, Keith Conroy, doing backgrounds on there. So it was like getting the band together again, which was That's great. Great, man. And it sounds like a little bit of destiny there. I like that a lot. What's, yeah. what's next for you? I know that you, uh, you know, as you wrap a project and it's out there and people can buy it, you're already working on stuff that you can't oh, tell yeah. us too much about. What are you working on right now? Oh, well, right now, the big thing is, uh, is that I'm working on right now is um, while I was doing this, was I'm working on Excellence for Robert Kirkman, uh, written by Brendan Thomas and right. uh, drawn by Kari Randolph. That's my thing right now. And um, and I have a couple of other things that are, are that I can't really talk about that <laughs> that will eventually appear. But I'm I'm always doing I'm always doing something. And one thing about freelance is you kind of have to use a bit of foresight where one ends and where one begins. You have to figure out where that sort of space is and where you can kind of put that then then look for the next job in advance. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Emilio, I can't wait to have you back on the show to to, uh, to find out what your next project is when you can talk about that. I've already seen some of the motion comic stuff in Contra uh, Rogue Corps, and you've kicked ass with that, my friend. So congratulations well, on that. Have a great uh, couple of days as uh, you know people start to get this game and give you feedback. But uh, it's it's great to see this. And what's so exciting for me is that this is the first game that your work is actually in the game and it's such yes. a cool thing man congratulations <laughs> thanks a lot it's it's just it's really cool to just to, to be able to finally share this and also just just have it out there you know just coming right on the tail of it. 
That's awesome. All right, everybody. That's Emilio Lopez. Thank you so much, buddy. We'll see you soon. Uh, right now, we're going to move over to uh, my review of Borderlands 3. Looked like a rough ride. You still with us, killer? I have no mouth, and I must vomit. Controversies with some of the stuff that's been going on at Gearbox and some of the casting that's been going on aside, I've been looking forward to playing Borderlands 3, and I have been able to play this game in a variety of different ways. There were a couple of hands-on sessions where I got to play on super pimped out PCs with beautiful headphones on, and I got pristine visuals at the highest fidelity possible. That was pretty damn incredible, but I also got to play it on my PS4 Pro, which has been less incredible. Let the hunt take Thank you. I'll get into some of the technical stuff here in a second, but this is a series that grew on me over time. My first sort of association with Borderlands, I remember reviewing this with Scott Jones, I just didn't get it. I thought it was okay. It was kind of in the shadow of a lot of other sort of post-apocalyptic titles out there, and the, the humor is so in your face that I might have had a slight aversion to everything that was happening to me, but I stuck with it, played it, played the downloadable content, and became obsessed and totally addicted with Borderlands. Loved Borderlands 2, loved Handsome Jack, even the, uh, the pre-sequel was kind of fun as well, but it's been a long time since we've had a main stage Borderlands experience, and that's what Borderlands 3 promised. To tell you the truth, it's all in there. The game is fun. It's loaded with a lot of the same stuff that we have loved in previous Borderlands titles. Zany characters, goofy sense of humor. Get here soon or you'll miss all the fun. And by fun, I mean getting bulldozed by corporate murder squads. Bajillion different types of guns, some that will get up and walk away. If you throw them out into the middle of a firefight. Lots of different ammo types. You can switch up different modes on some of the weapons, which is cool. So that just escalates the amount of collectability that you've got with all of this weaponry. You're going to be bouncing from planet to planet, so you're not just on Pandora this time. You're going to be seeing different worlds. You've got a ship called the Serenity, which is fun to explore, and you can customize little elements in there and do little side missions in there and lots of little nooks and crannies even within your own ship to explore. And, of course, tons of characters to talk to. And the cast is actually pretty competent. I was actually a fan of Balex, which Ice-T voiced. He plays this little um, teddy bear that uh, is, uh, well, he's an AI trapped inside of a teddy bear, and he's not happy about it. And I thought he did a pretty good job. I was actually uh, laughing when I played that originally. But there is a lot of stuff that just kind of lands with a thud. Or Honestly, it started to numb me out a little bit. It's a very talky game, and everybody's into it. And there's been a lot of effort to create a lot of production around all of this whiz-bang, slapdash humor with, with crazy characters. But it's it just... It sort of numbed me out after a while. I like the twins, these crazy twins that are psychotic and they sort of enlist billions and billions of psychopaths to chase after our vault hunter and they're popping in with live streams saying, look, we've got billions that are willing to die for us. How could you ever hope to compete with us? And they're constantly streaming in and taunting you and annoying. So, you know, it's fun to go after them. It's cool. They're decent bad guys. And then there's a bunch of kind of stereotypical little bad guys. Some will pop up in suits and I still like, you know, the way that they introduce all of the characters with their little sort of slow-mo motion with the title bits. But it's so familiar. I guess that's what I'm getting at, is that it's just so familiar and predictable. So I felt like I was in a little bit of a Groundhog Day playing the game. You know, I like the new mechanics. I like the way that it moves. The gunplay feels better and tighter, and there's definitely a lot more combat options available to you, which makes it fun. It's, you know, twitchy and enjoyable to play, which I dig. I also liked playing it online with somebody else. Whenever I would get stuck on a boss, I would just pop up online and make myself public, and then I would join and beat the boss, and then I could go back to playing it single player. So I, I could taste it in a bunch of different ways, which was great, and it was pretty elegant. I did let somebody else in, and we went off after a boss that was troubling me on a level that was troubling me. It was much easier 
but much easier. You know, it didn't scale up to make it as challenging and, and diverse as it had been when I was playing it in single player. And because I didn't know the person, I just played a public match. There were none of my friends that were available playing at that time when I wanted to test out the multiplayer. We weren't chatting. We weren't having that communal celebration that you have in a good match of Borderlands. And we all know what I'm talking about there. When Borderlands is at its best, you're playing with somebody that you have a great rapport with and you're having a blast together. And I didn't really get that. So I actually was having a little bit more fun just playing it alone. And so I beat the mission, got to the next level, played some of the next level, and I just decided to drop out and continue my path through the story alone, which the game allows you to do in a kind of an elegant fashion. <laughs> My boy is down! Let's go now, boy! Follow me! Come, friend! They will not hunt themselves! The game looks incredible if you've got the right machine to play this thing on. On the PC, when you crank everything up, even though it's cell shaded even though it's meant to kind of directly connect to previous Borderlands games, and that sort of cartooning quality of the game can kind of fool you into thinking, well, it doesn't look much different, but it can look pretty damn crisp and lush and beautiful on the right hardware. I was shocked at the frame rate issues that I had on the PS4 Pro. I know patching is going to be happening. I know tweaks and improvements will be happening, but it was really shocking to me. I couldn't play it in 4K without it feeling like a chug fest. I just felt like even in 1080p, it was still not moving and as as fluid as I had re remembered it from my previous playtimes, but also what I was expecting out of a game that we've been waiting for for so long. You know what, though? I still had fun, even in spite of some of these quibbles, even in spite of the familiarity, even in spite of the numbing zaniness that was coming at me. It's still a very enjoyable game. I will say that this loot mechanic of collecting all of these different weapons and filling up your inventory and having concerns about what you're going to drop and what you're going to use and you got to test every single gun out. I guess I've done that so many times that it got a little tiresome having to navigate through the inventory management to find the appropriate weaponry and to stick with it for a little while and constantly tossing things out and not, you know, filling up my bag so I couldn't pick up new weapons that look cool without drop. So, <laughs> I don't know what Gearbox could do, but I was just like, look at all these guns I'm just leaving here, all these cool things that I don't, I can't try, or they're like a level up from me, and I can't get, I can't use them, so I'd have to hang on to them, and then I'd fill up my bag with a bunch of weapons that I can't use till I get to the next level, which will probably be after I beat that boss. That was happening a lot, and so of course the most coveted thing that I would do would be to go back into my uh, ship and to buy more space in my bag so I could keep more guns that ultimately I would level past and never use. Here it goes! It's almost a, like too much of a good thing, you know? And I don't know if I could, I would throw that at the game itself. I think it's great that this comes back and it's sort of a similar experience to what we've known before. It's not like this always on type of experience. You know, you can pause and quit out and start right from where you were before, which is pretty great. And even when you get online and you can't pause because you're playing with somebody else, at least you're passing through checkpoints that you'll be able to go back to later on if you want to play it single player, or if you want to play with other people. If you love Borderlands, I think you're really going to dig leveling up in this game, but it's going to feel very familiar to you. I, I really wanted to be shocked by the experience. I guess that's what it is, you know? Like, we've been waiting a long time, and I just really wanted to feel like, oh my god, I haven't seen this in Borderlands before. And there are some new things, but they weren't shocking new things. It's a tuned, improved version of 
something that worked very well before. And you can't really fault Gearbox or 2K for kind of aligning in that direction, especially because Battleborn didn't work, you know, and they were going back to what has worked for the studio. It's already a big success. Been getting the press releases, it's selling like crazy, and it deserves to be played for sure. And I will continue playing this. And maybe it's going to be a game like some of my previous experiences with Borderlands where I just fall in love with it the more time that I spend with it. But right now, I'm not in love with it. I just think it's good. It's fun. I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. Yeah, I'll keep going with Borderlands 3. I see that uh, many of you love this game, and uh, I'll certainly have more to talk about it. I'm probably going to jump back in and get hooked on it when the DLC and stuff keeps coming out. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't say this in the review, but I came off of uh, Control and Astral Chain, and I'd way rather play those games again than play Borderlands 3. And that kind of filtered into my uh, appreciation of the title. Josue is here, and he brought a goose What's friend up everybody? with him. Hong Kong. This is the untitled goose game that's out there right now, and uh, uh, it's a crazy game. I, I really know nothing about it. Blake uh, said that we should play this today, so we're playing it. So thanks, Blake. I, all I know is that it kind of feels like a it's like a stealth action game, but you're controlling a goose. And I, I is that that pretty accurate? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So figure it out, Josue. You're on your own. Uh, this is let's. What's that? Oh, you can crouch under the trees. You can yell across the whole cafe, and Blake will yell across the whole cafe. What do I do next? <laughs> uh, okay, you guys, uh, this is Let's Play and Chat. You know the deal. If you've got any comments or questions, um, I saw a lot of people saying that they're not excited about the, the new Contra game. Um, and uh, uh, I will fill you in on my thoughts on it after I've played it some more. Uh, but uh, I do happen to love dual stick shooters. So let's take that caveat and throw that in there. And um, Smash TV is one of my favorite old school games. So it feels a lot like Smash TV, Smash TV to me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Vic Rules 666. Uh, Rogue Core sucks. It's nothing like Contra. Just cutting straight to the quick right there. Contra's, you can, you can, you know, reinterpret Contra. Contra isn't set in stone. It doesn't have to just be uh, like it was on the Super Nintendo or the NES or the Genesis. They can, they can uh, bring it out in different flavors. Uh, my, <coughs> I've got some kind of thing on my throat here. Dr. Oh. Games Love says, my main issue with Bo uh, Borderlands 3 on Xbox is that it crashes like crazy in multiplayer, twice for me and twice for my friend in about an hour. That doesn't sound good. They've clearly got some technical issues that they got to figure out with the game, and every game launches like that these days, let's be honest. So I'm sure that they've got lots of updates planned, lots of tweaks planned. Uh, Blair Farrell says the... Uh, uh, the VR grid. Uh, oh, VR grid says I'm treading on sacred ground right there. I don't know. I must have been talking about something uh, VR related in my review. And then uh, VR grid uh, from Blair Farrell says there's uh, you're the man dog uh, now dog bit in Tales of the Borderlands and a cowboy bebop reference. I'm not at all surprised. Uh, I don't know what that means. But I read those out. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, Red Eyes says, thank you, Vic, for being such an awesome guy. I've been watching you on the screen for 20 years now. Electric Playground. Thank you, Red Eyes. Do you have Red Eyes from watching so much EP over the years? We promise to give you more Red Eyes for many <laughs> more years to come, my friend. Uh, question from the VR Grid. Did you see uh, that Rambo creator hating uh, that he's associated with the new movie? I did see that, and I did see a lot of people hating my review. Um, and I, I, you know, I thought about putting up something else to kind of explain why, why I thought it was xenophobic, but I feel like explaining why I think a movie is xenophobic um, is going to get lost on the people that would uh, n not understand it for whatever reason, not understand why I would say that. And I didn't want to get into a big philosophical battle with a bunch of people out there. But I stand by my review. It sucks and it's xenophobic. Uh, I, uh, oh, the Serenity reference in Borderlands, Sacred Ground. You know what's funny? It's just down the street. Netflix is shooting a new show that at least is codenamed Firefly. Uh, didn't look like anything like the old Firefly series. There were some like retro Seattle police cars out there, which looks crazy. What up, Johnny McFly? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Adrian Leon, comment. Just wanted to answer your question from last show. The game is pronounced Greece. Greece. Okay. G R I S. I, I was pronouncing it uh, Gris. Uh, and he's saying Greece, Adrian Leon. 
Uh, oh, comment I'm from so. Blair Farrell. I uh, started listening to the episode of the Retro Hour that you're on when I was exercising this morning. Yeah, I was on the the Retro Hour podcast, which is uh, headquartered out of the UK. Uh, actually, it was actually Brian Provinciano that uh, connected us, and they ha- they actually had an episode with Johnny uh, from Happy Console Gamer not too long ago, and they had great things to say about him. I haven't heard that episode. Sorry, guys, I haven't heard yours either, Brian. Uh, but they were fantastic. They were, uh, um, uh, you know well-researched and had some good questions and, and uh, could totally appreciate what we had accomplished and have been accomplishing with Electric Playground. And they were, it was a super sweet hour with those guys. Um, uh, I didn't get to the pain and terror bit. No, I didn't, Taz. Um, Vic, your review of Rambo was the only one uh, bad one I've seen out of the five reviews I've watched now. They all say the same things and all the things I love, so I'll be supporting Rambo. Sorry, man. See, that's fine. That's, that's you know, you may love it. It's all good. I, uh, I, I, I it's, it's all good. <laughs> love your show, Vic. Kevin S., I've been a lifetime gamer, 41 years young, been watching since the G4 days. Thank you, Kevin. That rocks, man. Uh, comment, Vic, I think you're awesome. Thank you, Jeff. This is really sweet. Uh, oh, you're a naughty goose now, Robert Lino says. <laughs> uh, are you? Um, I love Smash TV. This is from Dr. Game Love, probably my favorite arcade game. Uh, Eugene Jarvis is the genius behind Smash TV, and he invented dual stick shooters with Robotron 2084, and he doesn't get enough recognition. He became uh, an arcade warrior and stayed with it. He worked at Midway for many, many years, and then he started his own company called Raw Thrills, which still to this day makes brand new arcade games. Uh, and he's worked on tons of games, NARC and, and uh, Defender and uh, Stargate and, and um, Cruising USA. Incredible, incredible history. Uh, let's see, let's see what we got here. Uh, Rick Savage's uh, Goose Simulator. There he is, calling it. Um, oh, let's see. Okay. Checking back here into the comments from a little bit earlier. Fat Chimp says, it would have been amazing if it was a side-scroller with visuals that looked like a comic book. That's, uh, I guess, Contra talk. You know what? People are going to have their opinions on Contra, um, and they're definitely going to voice them. The Internet is great for that. And, uh, you know, the stakeholders that that own Contra are going to read all of that stuff. What I love is that the guy that was around in the day supervising Contra games is still participating in getting the new Contra out. And... It may not succeed, but they're trying different hey, ways hey. to attack the uh, the delivery of the title. You know, maybe, maybe they don't want to recreate stuff. Maybe that was part of the reason why they brought out the anniversary collection um, to show uh, people, uh, you know, where it came from. And then this was the idea to, to kind of take it into a new era. Uh, but it, it may or may not succeed. I'll let you guys know. Um, Contra is a classic. I was hoping they would make a reboot of the series. That's Rick Savage right there. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, what's up, Vic? What are your hopes for the Joker from Johnny Dark? Uh, that was your question from the other day, wasn't it, Johnny? Uh, my hopes are that uh, um, it's incredibly thought-provoking and well-crafted. I already know it's going to be creepy, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix is going to look crazy and be crazy. Um, so I'm prepared for that. I just want it to be kind of fresh and... Um, impactful and it sounds like that's what it is and I don't want to hype myself up too much I haven't I've stopped watching trailers um you know I like the aesthetics of the film looks cool looks definitely looks like uh uh, Martin Scorsese picture I think it's trying to honor that kind of thing what was the uh comedian the Robert De Niro is a comedian yeah it has that king of comedy kind of vibe fused with taxi driver uh you know it's pulling from some great influences um, but it is still weird for me that Batman isn't in this. The, like the shadow of the bat isn't a part of any of this stuff. Uh, Christopher Kitch says, "Hey Taz, I don't know if I, uh, if you know, but if you kill the Chuka, Chuba Cabra on a, uh, on Athenias, I think it's called, uh, over and over on Mayhem mode, you get a lot of legendaries. Okay. There you go." There's your tip for you, the Borderlands 3 tip. Question from Sam I am 111 What exclusives are you looking forward to on the Google, Google Pay, Play Pass? I haven't checked into the lineup there, and quite frankly, the uh, I, I've got an iPhone, so I've just been digging into the uh, Apple Arcade stuff. There is so much gaming content on Apple Arcade, it's kind of overwhelming. 
it's crazy that these, I mean, it's like Netflix, right? That's the whole thing. Remember the, the first time you loaded up digital Netflix and, and looked through the library there, and you're like, you'd spent the whole night trying to figure out what to watch? It's very similar with the uh, Apple Arcade, and I presume with uh, Google Play Pass as well. Um, but I think this is, honestly, it's a a new lease on life for a lot of mobile game companies out there and lots of cool little indie studios that were struggling to find an audience uh, in the sort of free-to-play race to the bottom that, that mobile gaming has become. Aww. And I, I, I think that this is really going to... It's going to bring about some huge changes. I don't know if the free-to-play stuff is going to completely disappear, but it's going to seem... It's the price of a cup of coffee, and you get all of these games, and there's no extra costs. It's pretty good, you know? Some of these games that I've already played on Apple Arcade have, have made me very happy, and I'm sure a lot of them are going to be the same thing on Google Play Pass. Uh, the graphics look terrific in it. I'm surprised it's one of the Sega Genesis... Uh, oh, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Audrey and Leon. I've only been listening and chatting, just looked at the game. What the hell is happening? <laughs> this, I don't know what's happening, Jose. What is, what's going on in this game? I'm trying to trick this guy into <laughs> getting wet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you having I'm, a good time? I'm having a great time, just <laughs> goosing around. It's a, it's a cool, uh, it's almost like an impressionistic painting or something yeah. like that, right? Like, I like the art style. I really like the art style, yeah. And it, yeah, it, even though it doesn't have the details and all the textures and stuff, it's still, you know exactly what every character is and what they're trying to do. It's crazy, man. Games have uh, gotten so creative and freeing. Like, you can come at a, a content sort of problem from any direction and you get crazy ideas like this such a crazy idea uh heavily considering apple arcade with some of the stuff that they were showing off like frogger choo choo rocket and the Mistwalker rpg that's coming that's from ab uh, abby jameson um i'll tell you something i've been playing that frogger game and i've it's played it with my kid and we were both having a good time they're in like a little uh i always like these games like micro machines where you're controlling a toy or you're in a toy-sized world, so everything is oversized. That's that's what you're doing in Frogger. You're collecting little baby frogs and navigating over all kinds of uh, toys that have been littered across the, the landscape. It's quite fun. Uh, Grand Coombe has a question. Hi, Vic. Uh, is there any Nintendo game series that you are hoping comes to the Switch that hasn't made an appearance yet on the console? Uh, I, I think it's time for a new Earthbound game. You oh, know, yeah, like There's always sure. these little... Uh, you know, love letters thrown in the direction of that series, like especially in Smash, and I just I feel like that's been dormant for so long. Um, I think a Punch Out game would, you know, the Punch Out game that uh, was out on the Wii, I think, uh, that Next Level made, right? Yeah. It was the uh, that was great. Super Nintendo Punch Out was awesome. I think we we haven't had a good Punch Out game in a long time. It would be amazing if Nintendo. Um, found a way to kind of bring back a James Bond game that had the impact of uh, GoldenEye. Um, I mean, we all want Metroid, and that's coming. Uh, it would be great, honestly, to, to have a lot of the Game Boy Advance games um, come back in the way that the Super Nintendo stuff is being sort of thrown out there, but also uh, some of them remastered, you know, and, and re-looked at because there was so much great... Um, talent involved in a lot of those old GBA games, and because uh, a lot of them came, a lot of the, the developers came from the console space in 16-bit, and uh, the GBA kind of lapsed in as everybody else was moving into 3D on the console. So it'd be cool to have some of these great 2D games remade, kind of like what Link's Awakening um, just did. You know, that that would be amazing. Uh, not necessarily all from Nintendo. Uh, question, what's a YouTube, from what's a YouTube? Have you seen the De Death Stranding gameplay? What do you think about it? I feel Kojima is starting to believe his own hype. I've seen a little bit of the, uh, of the gameplay and it does look weird, uh, but uh, you know, every one of the Kojima developed titles and his team uh, developing the title always <laughs> delivers something interesting. Like they may not all be, uh, you know, the very best, uh, uh, like I'm thinking of the Metal Gear games and, and my favorite is three and I love four. Uh, and the first one, but uh, there, there's always something fun and redeeming and worthwhile and, and crazy. And I doubt that this first foray into running his own team and his own studio, um, they're going to drop the ball. I know that they got incredible talent to put all of this stuff together. The uh, the tweet that he put out there yesterday, I don't know if everybody saw it, where he, he uh, kind of laid out all of the job titles that he has was a little problematic, but I think that had more to do with the translation than 
um, wanting to beat his chest and tell everybody how how uh, how much he took ownership over every aspect of building the game. It did come off weird, though, for sure. Uh, regarding what a YouTube's comment, I saw some headline about Kojima saying the game might not be uh, get really fun to play until you're halfway into the game. That's from Olaf Christ- Christensen. I would say that a lot of the Kojima games uh, demand your attention and expect that you're in for the long haul, and and they do get better uh, the deeper that you get into. And that's that you can say that about a lot of titles, but specifically, I think with a lot of the um, ambitious ideas that Kojima introduces into his games, you have to commit to them. I know when I played through Metal Gear Three, uh, for the it was an emotional thing by the end of it it was it felt very much i was hooked on the show 24 at the same time as i was playing metal gear 3 and it felt like it was a similar feeling like getting to the end of a season of that 24 when it was good and finishing metal gear 3 it was like like just it was a ride you know um and i didn't feel that all the way through with 3 because there was some cumbersome stuff and some clunky stuff which they later addressed in uh uh you know subsequent uh uh remastered uh, versions of 3 um, but by the end, I just fell in love with that game. All right, this is going to be the last question. This is from D9000. Uh, hi, which modern console will make the best mini console in 30 years? Oh, my God, that is a fantastic question. <laughs> that is a fantastic question. I guess the PS4 has had so many cool exclusives, but presumably we're about to enter the era where we don't forget about the past. You know, I think what this generation has taught us with the re-release of all these mini consoles and uh, things like the, the SNES library and the Xbox compatibility is that these games should be able to be played forever and hopefully PlayStation remembers that with PS5 so you can access these games whether you have it on disc or in your digital library forever and um, hopefully we won't need these mini consoles in the future you know who knows and uh maybe we're entering a future where you get a whole library of games and it costs five bucks a month all right you guys that's gonna do it for us for this episode of ep live i'm very excited about wednesday's guest you're not going to believe who is on here speaking of mini consoles um tom kalinsky the former president of sega who was there during the uh the heyday of the sega genesis and the launch of the sega saturn is going to join us uh, on Wednesday's show, and uh, you could come and be a part of the audience here at uh, the VFS Cafe at 390 West Hastings, or please do join us on the stream. Uh, we're going to have a fantastic conversation with Tom Kalinske. Uh And I, I was there at E3 1995 when Tom Kalinsky said, and you could pick up the Saturn starting tomorrow. <laughs> and it was released early, and it pissed off a lot of people. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but also, of course, we're going to talk about the Sega Genesis. That's our show for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for subscribing. We'll see you on Wednesday. And until then, play forever, as the goose says.